man. He's still as he was. He's still brutal, violent, aggressive, acquisitive, competitive. And he has built a society along these lines. System. These are elements that are systemic issues, not only to capitalism, but to the very entity and organization of money itself. Uh, they are inherent problems that will lead to collapse of any system in which it appears as a regulating force. The broad realization is that as a mechanism for successful cooperation and survival, money has outgrown its usefulness. This talk is both in advocation of an actual paradigm shift away from monetary economics based on trend analysis and logical conclusions drawn from these systemic issues, not personal opinion about the moral implications of a rich or poor society or you know, even currency-based exchange operation, but rather focused on, uh, for want of a better word, the accounting for the effects and consequences of the monetary system in our social operation. Uh, part two, then, will be how we diagnose what actually matters in social operation, then, if we are looking beyond what is currently valued and supported by our system. What is worth pursuing? What can be agreed upon as a basis for life value, if you like? In other words, what sets of priorities should we be considering before we can move away from what we have now? Where do we need to go from here? Lastly, I'll discuss the resolution of the systemic issues we see at hand, a move to a resource-based model of global life. And what effect does such an economic shift present to us, and what is supported by such a system? We'll have a Q&A session after that. So part one, um, amongst the many issues with the monetary system, I want to characterize four as chiefly important when it comes to assessing the viability of the system. The first is the value of money, or what is considered to give money value. Contrary to the uh, belief that money is actually either backed by a tangible asset of some inherent value, like gold or silver, or that it is itself already the tangible asset. Uh, contrary to that, money is manufactured out of debt to begin with, and as such has no actual value whatsoever. It is what is known as fiat money, an empty promissory note given value by two things, the general belief in money's value and the scarcity in the money supply. So this realisation that the monetary system is essentially a mutually shared illusion, uh, inheriting some of its power from acceptance through exposure to uh, its system is an important one should play some role in freeing us to be able to step back and reconsider it as something that can be isolated as a contrivance and one worth updating or surpassing. 90% of human history was pre-monetary or non-monetary uh, and it was based on you know, the so-called real economy. Uh, this article from The Onion is of course satirical, you know, US economy grinds to halt as nation realises money is just a symbolic mutually shared illusion. What was very interesting though uh, when it was uh, put online is the juxtaposition you get with an advert for uh, African poverty and an advert <laughs> above it. 
so you end up not being able to know what's real and what isn't uh, in that sense, um, thanks to the internet. So, and yet, despite this sort of implicit understanding that, that money is a human contrivance, uh, there's nothing true about it in that sense. Uh, money is even more fictive uh, than its relative new status in human history or its existing necessary belief system, which is required for its validity. Um, it's actually even more insane than that. Uh, the manufacturing of money also demonstrates its complete divorce from reality. Money comes into existence, some of it right around the corner from us, in many ways uh, as it's loaned from a central bank to a commercial bank or a financial institution that dots our society. Uh, it's lent to the market and would be extinguished by its ultimate repayment by the commercial bank to the central bank. In other words, Money is created by producing a debt. It is manufactured on liability, not on value. Upon receipt of this money uh, transfer from the central banks, it is then uh, lent out to you and me directly in the form of a mortgage, where actually most money is created from, or a credit card, uh, or indirectly in the forms of uh, business loans or other funding that ultimately might meet our bank accounts as salaries or something similar from an employer. The problem is that, as the money is being lent from a bank to an individual, it's also being created out of thin air on the spot as a bookkeeping entry every single time it's uh, lent uh, or every single time it's borrowed, depending on how you're looking at it. Certainly, if I borrow 10 grand, it is being lent to me from a bank. However, not only is money invented by the borrowing of it by commercial banks, the cycle is extended uh, into the further lending that banks do. If I deposit that 10 grand into another bank account, either by paying someone or simply paying into, into some account. The money then sits there and can be lent out again. Uh, this time the bank shaves off a reserve. We can read that while I'm talking. <laughs> uh, traditionally this reserve was like 10%. So of a 10 grand deposit, 9,000 is lent out and 1,000 is kept as a reserve. Except that actually 9,000 is created on top of the 10 grand. As Modern Money Mechanics, the workbook published by the Federal Reserve Bank in uh, the branch in Chicago says, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits to the borrower's transaction accounts. Loans, assets, and deposits, liabilities, both rise by $9,000. Depositing this in another bank will of course raise the bank's reserves to 9000 too. However, even while deposited, that money can also be lent out. The bank lays aside a this fictive 10% and then loans out 8100 in new money. Of course, not from the deposit, but invented on top of the deposit. 8100 in new money that has never and will never exist as value, but as debt. This goes on and on and on. A deposit of 10 grand will engineer new money uh, out, of, out of nowhere to the tune of 100,000 pounds. The net effect of this booming debt expansion as uh, more and more loans are, are deposited and then reinvested as loans go on and on again is just the expansion of ever more debt. All money is literally created by the process of indebtedness. It has no value. All money in your account is someone else's liability. And uh, every penny in your wallet is owed by someone to someone else and ultimately all of it is owed to the banks. This enmeshes, is, uh, this enmeshes debt chain, sorry, let's start again. This enmeshed debt chain, which magnifies each level of debt into endless borrowing, is made impossible to operate without bankruptcy, social stratification, and aggregation of most wealth in few hands, because of interest. Not only are we all carrying magnified debts in the form of valueless money, but we don't even have enough money to pay back the money that was created. Practically all loans are loans uh, at interest, and each time uh, new money is lent, interest is uh, charged on that as well. And most importantly to realize about this phenomenon is that the interest that needs to be repaid is not created in the money supply. It needs to be gained from interactions with other people to their detriment, um, and they to yours. And compound interest is of course interest charged on a principal plus any prior interest. Um, anyone with an old credit card debt will know this, as well as the horror they must experience when they compare uh, what is being borrowed in principle uh, versus what was ultimately repaid with interest. Uh, often this is uh, double what the outlay was, and again, it's all invented. So we have a shrinking pool of actual money, but 
was invented anyway, in comparison to the ballooning interest and principle. It, it can only ever lead to bankruptcy, default, stratification, poverty, crime, and so on. A final point on interest, uh, the byproduct of uh, tying positive accruing interest to positive accounts while charging a negative compound interest to uh, in debt creates a reinforcer to class division that isn't based on skill, ability, need, or anything else. Instead, this division is based solely on the fact that someone has money uh, and someone does not. A millionaire will accrue £50,000 in one year simply by having money in an account which features a 5% interest rate. People living on loans or credit cards uh, or otherwise indebted will be charged ever increasing interest on their debts. But this money essentially pays the rich in that sense. This is the logic of that sort of closed cycle. Uh, it is a structural class division that is untouched by any woolly sentiments about the big society or any change that a politician enacts that isn't to do with the natural flow of money from people who don't have it to people who do. We have built into a system whose function is to divide. Now, many might say that that's the drive to overcome our lowly, lowly origins, as Darwin might say, and rise to the top. That's a key incentive in this system. But as the inbuilt dividing systems uh, themselves demonstrate, as well as the statistics on social mobility, which show increasingly that if you're born poor, you will die as such too, this is evidently not the case. Social mobility is against the interests of those currently doing well in the system, if you like, those currently in power, uh, those who are doing well. It is a, a direct competition to their own well-being. For after all, the rich and prosperous are only taken care of if they have money too and have enough to maintain their stratified position. And since wealth determines everything from social standing, education, resource access, all the way through to personal feelings of self-worth, and the mechanism of debt, interest, and vested established places can only magnify wealth into the hands of the few, who, uh, who then justify this as being productive members of society rather than lucky members of a team with an unfair advantage in the game. Unfairness being the definition of the game in, the pro in progress to begin with. Society will uh, become, has become more divided, more unequal, more criminal, as the economic model fails to satisfy even the most basic needs of life requirement, it makes it more dangerous, it makes it less functional for all of us. And that's not even to go into building concrete systems that then fail and crash and, and all the rest of it. We don't even count that, and of course that is all dictated by whether we can afford to build it or not. And of course this is in fact what we see. Life expectancy is inversely correlative to inequality in a society. The higher the inequality, the less likely there is any public health option, the worse the food is that the have-nots uh, are likely to be able to afford, the sooner you die. The same trend is seen for obesity for almost exactly the same reason. Obesity is in fact also a byproduct of the basic requirement of our society to consume ever <coughs> more. Quite literally, we have to get fatter and fatter if we uh, support an all-out growth economy. Does anyone, everyone understand that? I only came to that realization this year. The obesity epidemic has nothing to do with basic health, really. It becomes an issue about basic health. But it's the combination of uh, heavy uh, advertising that plays off your social stratification to begin with. You are poor. Here, have this sandwich, right? That then leads to obesity. And of course, you've got to keep selling, selling more food every, every time. Um, here's the same trend for mental illness. Mental illness is particularly dangerous not only to trust and social cohesion, uh, but solidifies the lack of ability to progress in society. You are literally disabled from it. Uh, as such, the tendency of already divided societies is to entrench and expand the vision by design. For more on these statistics, I recommend to you the Quality Trust website or the Spirit Level by Wilkinson Pickett, who I draw these graphs from. You see the same thing in drug abuse, length of prison sentences, size of the prison population, infant mortality, all of these things can be linked to uh, the inequality statistics. And it's important to explain what I mean by inequality, or rather what Wilkinson and Pickett talk about when they mean inequality. It's not the uh, finite level of wealth. It's not the, you know, everyone's a billionaire in this society and they have like 20 people who have two grand. It's the difference, the ratio between the top 10% in the society and the bottom 10%, not any finite definitions of anything else. And it's in fact the only correlative as well. Absolute poverty doesn't correlate with this. 
uh, nor does anything else. It is knowing uh, that you're that distant and that unable to succeed or be looked after as well as the people who are doing well. That's inherent violence. Those are the basic mechanisms of money then and their systemic effects. Three more angles are important here too. One is to do with the possibilities for innovation, one is to do with resource use and waste, and the final one has to do with the false barometer effect of the market which is fed through the news to us. We'll begin with the last one first. In 2011, Lloyd's TSB announced the wholesale dismissal of at first around 30,000 positions, 30,000 positions in their corporation. And then, hot on the heels of the first announcement, a second bout of some 15,000 positions. Oh, that's only half the amount, that's all right. It was one of the many such moves in 2011, the year in which, of course, the decimation of the world economy began to make out its true face in the cuts that we saw on public services, health systems, travel, commuting systems, and more. What went largely unnoticed in the media at the time, or at least went entirely unspoken, uh, was that as soon as the news of the job cuts from Lloyd's hit the market, the stock of the bank rose upon the good news. Uh, markets took the news well, with Lloyd's share price closing uh, up 9.7% on the London Stock Exchange, making it the biggest climber in the FTSE 100. Oh, good. Uh, that's great. I'm glad about that. Then. I can sleep well. <coughs> 45,000 people lost their jobs for good reasons. Um, as such, our default market indicators of share price and aggregate demand are not strict indicators of job health in the economy. Their rise doesn't register a flourishing of human welfare. They register the growth of money. They, they register, if we're talking about GDP, just the rate of transactions. That's all, the number of transactions. As such, every time you hear about the economy growing, you need to decode the phrase. It's not a growth in human support system. Those aren't measured by economists at all. The uh, more disease uh, is diagnosed in the economy, and thus the more medicines are sold, the higher the GDP. Does that mean a healthier society? <clears throat> Literally not in that case. You would not consider it good news if your doctor told you, you, told you that your tumour had grown 10% in less than a month. Growth does not equal advancement. And the idea of continual unimpeded growth in a finite environment equals death. As uh, uh, Helena uh, Norberg um, Hodge, co-director of the film The, Ec uh, the Econ Economics of Happiness, says, uh, an oil spill, the GDP, GDP goes up. When drinking water is so polluted we have to buy it in bottles, GDP goes up. War, cancer, epidemic illnesses, all of these involve an exchange of money, so they end up on the positive side of the balance sheet. The problem here is that the economic indicators mask growing social breakdown in a level of rising numbers. The chart goes up and the market response is to, is to create more money out of more money. The life value is ignored. The charts go down and life systems are sold off to make the chart go up again. Our barometer of uh, health has been decoupled and inverted. Ignorance equals strength, freedom equals slavery, war equals peace, growth equals great. Orwell was deliberate in placing these slogans in 1984. The inversion of meaning is real, and this is the primary method of control, a priori control, of the framing of cultural discussion. Oh, well, if you're against the free market, you must be against markets and freedom. Uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Never mind that freedom is no longer the same meaning as it was before, it doesn't matter, we're talking about the same words, it must be the same. It is freedom to infinitely pursue money creation by money possessors. On the point of innovation, I've spent quite some time on this subject in a lecture titled The Innovation of War, which can be found online. I'll summarise here the basic effect. Um, any established institution, very much like the established individuals that we were speaking about, must maintain their position to the exclusion of all competitors, including newer, better, more effective or cheaper practices. The electric car, or any transport which is clean, safe, fast or resource efficient, is as technologically possible is absolute anathema to the industries of automotive production of automotive repair. Um, the more repairs, the better, in fact, for the economy. New, better solutions are not promoted even by the profit motive. They are, in fact, hindered. Uh, MBA Online published a unique study two months ago in which uh, it dissected the phenomenon of patent trolls in the American Sil Silicon Valley innovation landscape. I say unique because it was animated with cartoons of people with lightsabers. <laughs> Uh, patent trolls are organisations that deliberately set out to own and profit from patents without doing any innovation themselves, not actually producing anything. Amongst the facts displayed by NBA Online, we learn the following. 270 lawsuits, which cost 
money, energy and time and more were filed in 2011 for patent infringement. The total defence cost is in millions. Millions which could have been spent on, you guessed it, innovation. This is a massive wastage on a grand scale. And the trend is set to get worse. Patent litigation has nearly doubled since 1991. Google acquired Motorola this year for its patents, meaning $12.5 billion was spent on the freedom to innovate without hindrance. That's really what it was. They were buying them for their thousands of patents that they held. What would 12 billion in investments in Google's clean tech venture arm, Google.org, have been? And in fact, they recently canceled their venture to try and find a cheaper renewable energy source than coal. Uh, they canceled that. Maybe 12 billion would have been quite good at that. Uh, instead, it's wasted on forced purchases of ideas to prevent lawsuits. Google aren't the bad guys here, nor a motor runner. It's the logic of the system that forces these acquisitions, forces that kind of litigation. Uh, and this trend is seen in medical care, general technology, housing, and more. It retards our society in every way. And the worst thing is it retards it in a way that we don't see, because we just don't see the things that aren't produced. We don't see things that are great and then got rid of. We just don't see the potential at all. And this is implicit to the monetary system itself. Monetary reform will do little to nothing to prevent the blockading of disruptive technologies. Meanwhile, millions more die, and our possibilities for overcoming problems through scientific advances still remain with us. As long as you have to defend your position in society with monetary gains, everyone collectively loses. Finally, resources and production. Every company in a monetary system is forced by cost efficiency, another inverted word, meaning that it has nothing to do with real physical efficiency at all to produce every good or service at the lowest possible unit cost, using the cheapest make-do resources, and then sell them at the highest possible price. Anything less than this, and the competition is winning your market share. This produces three negative consequences, in particular one, items are manufactured poorly and thus break down during use. Mobile phones, televisions, and more, are in fact calibrated to break down within time frames as narrow as particular months. Who here has a mobile phone that keeps breaking down? Did you buy another phone since last year, or the year before, or the year before that? Even if you didn't, millions are. Uh, in 2004, we already had something like 11 million phones that were being thrown away every year, <laughs> uh, filled with minerals that would take billions of years to be recreated. Of course, on the flip side, this is actually a source of further income to that company. Uh, if its marketing can trump the annoyance of their broken products to begin with, uh, this is known as cyclical consumption and reinforces the need for this planned and cyclical obsolescence. We no longer buy products, we subscribe to them uh, in a resource consuming bit to keep the economy going. Uh, Apple Computer needs to know where it's going to get its money from next year. Lots of people have already saturated the market, you've got as many people as possibly going to buy your product, you've got to make sure it breaks down so they can buy it again. And one single trend underscores everything we've looked at so far. In the pursuit of the greatest profit, in the bid for cost cutting, in the bid for higher consumption and higher demand, one overriding point will make our economic way of life completely impossible. This feature is known as technological unemployment. A concise definition of this phenomenon could be seen as the uh, unemployment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. That's how the economist John Maynard Keynes described it. Uh, and you'll note his correct use of the word economize, meaning to save or make efficient some process or system. Today's economy, as we've seen, in this sense of the relationship of resources and uh, operation, is in fact an anti-economy, another word, inversion. I have to read that, just in case you can't see it. Uh, the role of humans as the most important factor of production is bound to diminish in the same way as the role of horses in agricultural production was first diminished and then eliminated in the, uh, by the introduction of tractors. Very, very important. That was uh, uh, Vasily, Vasily Leontiev, one of the uh, German <coughs> economists who is onto something, I think. Automation has steadily been reducing labour availability in the market. Once upon a time, the displaced jobs were usually caught up in an emerging sector. Uh, agricultural automation was caught up by the industrial sector. 60% of uh, Americans worked in agriculture in 1860. Uh, agriculture was the economy. Today, less than 1% work on agriculture. And we're dealing with a much higher output of, of product production. Productivity, when we look at the trends, is positively influenced by mechanization. It's inverse to employment, in fact. 
But what we have seen hot on the heels of the farming revolution was, of course, the industrial revolution as well. Uh, and at the very core innovation, the very core technology of the Industrial Re Revolution was the very process of employing machines for greater productivity and new possibilities anyway. So it didn't take very long for manufacturing to be something that employs, in fact, 8% of the American economy now. And exactly the same thing is, is obviously happening here. Uh, those innovations, those uh, agricultural revolutions and so on, are in fact, of course, create, they were created in the UK by these sorts of in the tandem at least. Uh, this automation will not stop. McDonald's, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Booth's, Morrison's and more are slowly replacing tills with uh, automated checkout. Online shopping now dominates high street transactions and online shopping is 100% automated if you think about it. Uh, orders are submitted to systems, not to people. Machines carry the workload of several former employees, especially within manufacturing. They don't get sick, Bored, tired, need health care, holidays, payroll tax, they're faster, more exact, they're faster, I mean, faster twice, more exact, uh, and can be employed for 24 hours a day, and don't yet demand labour unions, not yet, they will one day. Automation is cheaper, more efficient, and offers the basis for a, the true possibility of a post-employment economy, an era in which humanity is at last free from repetitive, non-inspirational labour. And automation will increase as technology feeds off itself and follows an exponential pattern, uh, pattern doubling human knowledge every 13 months. 13 months ago, we knew half what we know now. In another 13 months, we'll know twice as much as we know now. Stop and think about how, many, how much that is. Doubling the size and spread of the internet on a yearly basis, doubling information transfer speed, information volume, and shrinking exponentially in size in these machines. Uh, dropping exponentially in price, halving everything. Harding is not the correct way of describing it, but dropping and dropping and dropping. Uh, in fact, uh, Adam was telling me before this interview, they're selling iPhones for 25 quid. That thing is a thousand times more powerful than the MIT supercomputer in the 1970s. And that cost 11 million dollars. Right? This is a big trend and it affects everything. It means that ultimately automation is going to be much cheaper than human labor, even if you think you're special, even if you think your job somehow isn't technical, even if it was, what do you want of 10, 20, 30 percent? What if it's 50 percent? How are we going to do with 50 percent unemployment? That's what you'll have. Um, technology follows its own scientifically self evident trend, irrespective of the system surrounding it. And in fact, in some cases, is nothing but hindered by the present change fear invested interests. These sorts of jobs aren't coming back, and as artificial intelligence becomes more and more advanced, our employability can no longer be used as the basis for an economy to begin with. At this point, we need to begin to focus on the emerging paradigm then. Our core resources are expiring, our economy needs to economize. A complete reversal of what it does now. Money, both in its present form of fiat-based debt and unpayable interest, not only divides and impoverishes people, but negatively impacts innovation, takes the place of what is really important, that inverted graph of uh, value, and will fail by design. Crime and illness rise in concert with social stratification and value as well. So what do we do? We need to manage our global household. That was, in fact, the definition of economy to begin with, thanks to the Greeks. The management of the household is actually the true meaning. Uh, we are one planet, a sphere, a globe, with no boundaries left to consider valid. The environmental, social, and political effects of failed systems are now being felt globally. Fukushima. That's not something that is divided by a nation. You'll get the problems that Fukushima had if you're Japanese or not. Uh, and as such, we need to consider global solutions to global problems. It's time to ditch the growth economy, for starters. There's no such thing as infinite growth in a finite space. We need to move to a stable, steady-state economy where preservation, not simply accumulation, is the core value. We cannot hope to be efficient while also presiding over a system which simply values the metric of consumption over and over at ever-increasing rates. We need not only to preserve resources, but maximize the technology and systems to make efficiency skyrocket. Uh, presently, we waste 99% of industrial resources within six weeks of the industrial process. Almost everything is waste, is the grand realization. 25 tons of mined materials produce five tons of usable materials produce one ton of usable product. Why? Because it's the cheapest way to mine. If we even cut that figure in half, that 99% figure, we'd be dealing with many hundreds of percent increases in, in, in efficiency. 
and an access abundance for everyone. How is this access abundance distributed? We need to move from a general method of consumption known as ownership to one of availability provided when needed. This logic already exists in pockets. Uh, who here owns a shopping trolley? Communists. You don't own your own shopping trolley? You don't own an Asda shopping trolley to go to Asda? You don't own a... Well, that's weird. Hotels, shopping carts, zip cars, uh, or ad hoc rental services are all systems which have in them the seeds of a new social design. Let's use the example of cars. Were we, uh, for example, to build truly robust, safe, long-lasting fleets of cars with Doppler radar that prevent crashes, navigation systems that coordinate the best routes with statistical feeds from all other vehicles on the road, where they are, where they're going, and so on, and then make these available for people as they need them? One can either pick them up, uh, where they're placed around the city, as it is the case with zip cars, or Stadtauto in Germany, and there's a few in London already, or they could feasibly be navigated automatically to the preferred location. That sounds like science fiction, but it's already been done. Uh, in fact, where are they? The zip car, there was a Google car here somewhere. There it is, I'll just put it there. That's the kind of system we need. What would the effect of that be if introduced into a city system properly, the way it's actually needed, not the way it can be afforded? First off, you'd need fewer cars. Cars spend 80% of their lives sitting on driveways or parked along roads, making roads less usable. Uh, the amount of villages I've been to where there's a, where there's a two lane road with cars parked on each side, it's only a one lane road then, isn't it? That's pollution. That's car pollution. Um, that would go away. Wasted metal and plastic just sitting there. Provided as needed, we would use less resources and need less units while meeting the needs of every person needing transport. That's if we're ignoring integrated, holistically built, proper public transport. At the same time, car accidents, which are the failure of poorly designed technology and fallible human opinion in the navigation process, would drop dramatically. They've already compared to the past situations of cars. The, the, the levels have dropped. However, with a half a million people dying worldwide in car accidents every year, we can see the kind of violence we would avoid simply by updating our technology to what we can do now. Traffic jams would diminish through lower accidents and less units on the road. And that's also ignoring the fact that we're not all going to be going to work at 9 a.m. pretty soon. Uh, that's just an inevitability, no matter what system you have going. There's nothing left to turn up at 9 a.m. for. In fact, the reason we can turn up at 9 a.m. Is, is now pretty arbitrary compared to the fact that we are working globally uh, already with the companies we have. Um, on the subject of jobs, sorry, uh, traditional uh, jobs are already disappearing. We need to make a global effort to embrace automation. It is socially responsible not to employ the best, most safe, clean and efficient forms of production. The jobs aren't coming back. Stop chanting it in the streets. And nor would we want them to. The human mind is still our most prized resource. It should be employed in rewarding, meaningful, real labour, so to speak, not literally run-of-the-mill tasks which exist for no reason than to prop up the system whose death knell has in fact come. How do we make decisions? Yeah, that's a big one, decision making. How do we do that? Because so far we seem to vote for things and we believe that that's a decision somehow. Uh, this needs to change as well. A lot of people ask who makes the decision in this new system. We need to begin arriving at decisions rather than making them. Uh, we vote in, uh, we don't even really vote for anything. We vote in personalities who are not qualified for any scientific understanding of social operation. A lot of people are yelling Ron Paul 2012 in the States right now. That man delivered babies for a living, all right? I'm not saying that he might not have some valid points about how the economy is run, but if you're putting someone in charge of the whole country, theoretically, that's what they're voting for. That's what they think that he will do. You might not want to pick a, a, a gentleman who uh, is involved in live births, maybe. Um, just a thought. Uh, in turn, these people are lobbying with vast amounts of money uh, to support and pass legislation which is, by definition, not going to be socially supportive. If it were, we wouldn't need to have them smuggled into the system with bribery, would we? The whole system is the corruption we face, the necessity to overcome. To this end, humanity needs to unify and share all its knowledge of global resources, scientific advances, advances understandings of the environment and more, based upon a holistic, interconnected understanding of the globe and us in relation to it. Vast advances in construction, planning, resource allocation, resource use would render hunger, thirst, energy problems and other scarcities a thing of the past. Whole cities need to be designed holistically. Now, people balk at the idea of planned cities. 
They think of Milton Keynes or Brasilia. Neither of these cities was built for efficiency. They were simply designed all at once, that's the difference. Brasilia requires, it's the one on the, the right there, uh, requires all traffic, whether coming from the north, south, east, or west, to pass through the center of the city. Which idiot built that, thinking it would work out? It's not operational, it's just yours. That's the only design about it. Milton Keynes is built according to ley lines, if anyone's into paganism. Alignments with the midsummer sun and so on. In other words, the design of a prior city fabrication has always been either accidental, or in the case of London, where more and more was pieced together over time, no one's fault, it's just the way it was, or the function has been a secondary consideration of the designers above weird beliefs or vanity choices. What kind of decision making is this uh, that we think we prize so highly in the current system? Uh, for some concrete examples of how truly modern design would work, uh, how buildings designed to be efficient, long lasting, earthquakes say, laid out for optical or optimal public transportation would look like, I would suggest two sources uh, for you that have already been designing new city structures for a very long time. One of them is the Venus Project, headed by Jacques Fresco. The other is the extensive work by uh, R. Buckman Sir Fuller, whose critical path covers a great deal of the necessities for correct social design as well. And don't try bringing up Russia's laughably inefficient Gauss plan system to me. Gauss plan with its five year plans wasn't focused on long term anything, and decided to use metrics such as limiting the number of miles a car could drive to a certain number per day, per week. This isn't based according to human need at all. It's some abstraction about as relevant as the market system, decoupled from what human beings need versus what is actually possible. Renewable energy, so long now a victim of underfunding and lack of development, not to mention rampant corporate, corporate lobbying designed to sideline or block true innovations in the field, needs to be made our central energy source. Solar, wind, tidal, geothermal and so on must be placed into our social structure in lasting, efficient, upgradable ways. Not the way we do things now, cheaply, messily, slowly, against the grain. If we are serious about energy, and we do need energy, and we just, then we just do it regardless of the invented overinflated costs, we will see incredibly seriously awesome results if we do that. A drop in air and water pollution, which has caused species extinction spasms a thousand times higher than the normal rate, would be the least of our benefits from such a system. How do we get such a civilization then, given everything in our past? Only mass awareness by the human population of the issues and their systemic and not personal nature will give rise to the drive towards a system of real freedom, real abundance, real material wealth, real safety, real toughness on the causes of crime, real toughnesses uh, on the causes of poverty. Nothing but a complete reversal of this system represents our chance to reverse environmental, social and political collapse. The good news is that mass awareness is already well on its way. The 2011 Occupy movement, with over 2,000 encampments around the world, was a symptom of the growing unease, uh, in fact, dis-ease, that's the word disease, coupled with the growing realisation of our system's inherent flaws. The Zeitgeist movement has more than half a million members, just us. This is nothing, especially when considering that they are being produced within a system that structurally inhibits social reconstructive discourse through media ownership and the traits of, trains of thought that are built into a syntax that presupposes the validity of institutions that we are surrounded by. Where did I go backwards? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. On an individual level, it's up to each of you, each of us, to learn about everything, how this system works, or rather how it doesn't work, what is possible, the latest findings of science. I receive emails all the time from people asking me to argue with their friends because they themselves can't hold a necessary conversation about economics or whatever. That's part of the problem. You must understand and educate yourself and others. We have the need of a third industrial revolution, a new enlightenment uh, of thought and action, a new post-scarcity, uh, post-money, pro-human, pro-environmental. Stop selling carbon credits and actually get off your ass. That's the goal. That's what's needed. And we must all become public intellectuals to that end, as individuals and as groups promoting 21st century understandings of where we need to go. The system's reaction will be to spew distortions and fallacies and propaganda against these notions eventually in the form of a very controlled uh, methodology. This must be overcome by mass education, mass awareness, creating a social immune system to the invasive money to more money cancer that dominates all important parts of society. Let the naysayers say it can't be done. Uh, 
uh, this is as good as it gets, a billion people starving, whatever. They will be consigned to the dustbin of history with those who said that heavier than air objects cannot fly in an era, in an era that definitely knew about birds, for example. Or that no one would have use of a computer. I think both of those are Lord Kelvin, by the way, who's actually also quite a good scientist. And it shows you we're not basing this on scientists, but on science. I consider it a stroke of luck that I have the exposure to these understandings. I humbly offer this train of thought to you in the endeavour that I can make you feel a little bit more lucky too, perhaps. As Martin Buber put it, we must humanise technology before it dehumanises us. And I can't think of anything more rewarding to be involved in, nothing which promises such unfathomably positive results with such universal promise of abundance and harmony than the collective global humanisation of our global household. We can only hope that the needle measuring the cultural zeitgeist around the world might begin to jump at registering this notion. And that as we push forward these values, the needle will jump ever higher and higher. We are faced with a value war, and it's one that humanity must win. Thank you.